For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. The 8th Ministerial Conference of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation was held in Senegal's capital, Dakar, on November 29th and 30th. The meeting was attended by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and leaders from across the African continent. The conference was held at an interesting time, as trade between China and the continent has increased substantially. In 2019, direct trade itself amounted to around 200 billion US dollars. A lot of the discussion has been on increasing the extent of cooperation and extending it to new fields. What were the major results of the conference? Michaela Herzog, a researcher with the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and a member of the Secretariat of Pan-Africanism today, who was at the conference, answers these questions. So I think it's important to start off with um, understanding that the Forum on China-Africa cooperation has been in existence now for 21 years, relatively short um, when we consider the kind of longer historical uh, institutions like the African Union or the United Nation. But what this uh, Forum for Cooperation means is that different African states are trying to build a kind of collective agenda for Africa's development in relation to China and in relation to different cooperation partnerships and exchanges. And um, in the last 20 years or 21 years now, what we've seen is we've had a lot of important advancements, not without different, you know, challenges because this is an experimentation this is relatively new but chinese infrastructure investments have totaled over 110 billion in the last 20 years and this has also you know boosted different industries in africa so we've seen over 16,000 kilometers of railroads and roads uh, at least 20 ports being built by chinese um companies through different uh, financing agreements over 80 power stations have been built and africa's trade volume with china is now around i think as of 2019 at 106 billion whilst the us has, has significantly dropped i think in 2019 it would have been around 30 or so billion um so Africa now stands with China as their kind of forerunner in terms of their economic and slowly, I think, more their political relationships. And so every three or so years, we have seen these meetings for the forum where we have a conference. And this is usually or would have been a whole taking place last year in Senegal, Dakar, hosted by the Senegalese government. But uh, due to COVID-19 and the various restrictions, it had to be moved to this year and usually would have been a heads of state meeting where we would have seen different African heads of state as well as President Xi Jinping and high level um, Chinese diplomats uh, being at the event in person. But they, again, due to security and safety reasons, decided to have a ministerial meeting or a ministerial conference. So we had different foreign ministries being represented and uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi was one of them who represented China and was present physically here. But in the opening ceremony, we did have the opening ceremony co-chaired by President Xi Jinping and uh, President Macky Sall of Senegal. And I think an important aspect uh, that kind of speaks to, uh, you know, good gesture or good gesture and good faith was that other African heads of state were allowed to have the platform and to speak on the platform um, online, of course. Um, so President Zero Ramaphosa of South Africa spoke from online as well as the presidents of Egypt and Comoros. Uh, so they were online whilst many of us were sitting with the with the representatives of the foreign delegations in a um, conference hall in Senegal, Dakar. A couple of things about actually how things went and what was achieved was, you know, they signed a really important, uh, it's called the 2030 vision, which sets out not only the kind of key thematic areas of, of, of deepening cooperation, which the theme of the ministerial meeting was deepening cooperation, but it also set out, you know, the importance, of course, of solidarity around the COVID-19. Uh, it looked at different security issues. It looked at and raised the issue of climate cooperation. There was a big emphasis on technology and you know, digitization and different forms of capacity building. And if I can go through in Xi Jinping's opening speech, he set out very clearly what the kind of nine main action areas were for the kind of exchange we're hoping to have in the next uh, three years in this 2035 vision. And I mean, critics have said that the package given by China was not necessarily as high as in 2018, because in 2018, 
it was a, a 60 billion in financing um, was pledged and is currently still being dispersed. And in total, I think the the main dispersal looked like around 40 billion. But if you calculate the different um, sections that were covered, it actually could actually amount to almost the same. It's just been given less specificity in this initial proposal. And it's probably only been a few weeks time we'll understand really the depth of the financing. But what I think is important and is a failure of a lot of Western uh, journalists and analysts and experts is this focus on purely on financing and not really thinking about the comprehensive approach that uh, was being proposed. And just to mention, uh, I said these nine areas of action, um, they were poverty reduction and agricultural development, they were trade promotion, where they're going to try to have what they call green lanes for African agricultural exports. And very interestingly, they're proposing that in three years time, that by 2024, um, China is hoping to have at least 300 billion in uh, imports from Africa, which it currently stands at 100 billion. So that's quite a leap within the next three years. So that was probably one of the, the, the more interesting proposals, but otherwise uh, they mentioned, you know, they want to initiate and uh, support 10 connectivity projects, which, you know, would be increasing the kind of digital infrastructure in Africa. They looked at 10 um, industrialization. It was kind of like a 10, 10, 10 uh, project where in, within agriculture, they want to have 10 projects. They want to build 10 schools. Um, they're hoping to have at least uh, 10 industrialization and employment promotion projects. And there was also a good in, amount of emphasis on capacity building and trying to develop deeper cultural and people to people exchange. There was also interestingly a question of peace and security because uh, China, it, it does have a security presence on the continent in terms of the collaborations in the Horn of Africa around the piracy issues and it has for the last few years. But it seems like Africa is calling for more um, support in various UN and peacekeeping missions, which would, of course, inflame some uh, issues, existing issues of the kind of new Cold War that the US is trying to dominate the African continent with its foreign military presence. But that's just some of the, the areas that were raised. And of course, the big headliner in terms of one of the outcomes was that China has pledged to donate and produce in total 1 billion um, vaccines for, for Africans and 600 million of those will be donations whilst 400 million will be you know, bought but will be produced with an emphasis on being produced in Africa. So that was one of the big, I think, headliners that also got the, the, the Europeans and Westerners uh, concerned about what uh, China's future role will be on the continent. The conference took place even as the United States has been portraying China as a country Africa needs to be careful of. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in the continent recently, and even before, a number of US statements have focused on containing China. How successful has this campaign by the US been? How do African countries see these attempts by the US? Michaela talks about these issues. I mean, of course, it's not coincidental that uh, Anthony Blinken took a trip to Africa and visited, I think, three, four African countries, ending his trip in Senegal. It's no coincidence that he did so, I think it was 19th of November, and the conference began on the 29th, the China-Africa conference began on the 29th. And in, I think, one of his most reported interviews, one of his main things he said is that our... Africa policy is not about China. This is kind of the thing that he's been pushing, which again, interestingly, if your, if your policy or your approach to Africa isn't about China, why do you need to talk about it so much? But it's very clear that that's not the case because he arrives, you know, 10 days before the China Africa Forum of Cooperation is supposed to have its conference. And if we look historically in recent years at um, the US's presence on the continent, the US government's new Africa strategy, which was released in 2019, basically characterizes the situation in competitive terms. One of the lines that I have here in my notes is, you know, it basically says great power 
competitors, namely China and Russia, are rapidly expanding their financial and political influence across Africa. They are deliberately and aggressively targeting their investments in the region to gain a competitive advantage over the United States. So this is like in their Africa strategy, their kind of focus point is on this kind of uh, financial competition. So Lincoln saying that their policy in Africa is not related to China is a lie. And the documentation, the, the historical uh, policies prove that. And then two, it hasn't been a successful campaign in, in all honesty, because for a number of reasons, I mean, one is that they clearly don't have necessarily a, we are taking Africa for what Africa is. But two is that the way in which they tend to speak, the rhetoric is often very patronizing and a lot of African leaders feel that. Um, it carries a historical weight of the kind of white supremacist colonial project that patronizes to African leaders and patronizes that they don't know how to make good choices about their own countries and about their own destinies, which if you contrast to China is totally different because even the, the, the themes that were coming out and the kind of, even if you want to call it rhetoric that was coming out, still has a level and a degree of sincerity that is absent in US diplomatic um, speeches and, and, and conversations and policies, where it's, for China, it's about a common future, uh, a shared destiny advancing together. And even if we look at the numbers in terms of the priority that China has made with uh, diplomatic visits, I think since between 2009 and 2018, uh, Chinese diplomatic lead visits between China and Africa were like 222 trips. And of those 82 were top diplomats like Yi and others visiting. And Wang Yi, I think he's visited the continent, the foreign minister, Wang Yi, he's visited the continent, I think it's at least three times. This was his third visit this, this year. And he actually just uh, got to Ethiopia and visited them, I think in an important show of solidarity when they're having a very difficult situation there. And coming from the African side, uh, the last point maybe I'd raise is that in the speech of Isaita Talsal, who is the foreign minister of Senegal, I was surprised and uh, intrigued by the fact that she raised in many ways how China has been leading um, the kind of international multilateralist uh, wave or shift and allowing African countries and developing countries to take the stage and to be more equal partners in terms of global governance and, um, you know, international uh, relations and politics. So that was definitely an interesting point. But what I will say as an overall challenge that I think was very noticeable in the conference, as well as in the documentation that came out of the conference, is a little bit of an absence of, of Africa. It felt like the agency and the protagonism wasn't there from African leaders. There wasn't a sense of originality and creativity. Most of the documents do read like they are Chinese written documents, documents coming straight from um, you know, the Chinese government. And I think that's fine that there's an important contribution coming from China, but there wasn't a sense of discussion and co-creation of not only the declarations, not only the agreements and the 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 the, the China Africa vision of 2035, but they, there was still a lack of Africa coming to the table because whilst China was in, in, you know, emphasizing that they would send you know, 10,000, I think it's high level African professionals will go to China to receive you know, certain um, education and things like that. We didn't see Africans saying, you know, well, why don't we get Chinese people to come to our schools? We have great intellectual traditions, rigorous intellectual traditions um, where we could be offering even on a soft power basis. Maybe we, we can't offer China the same level of financing and you know, economic investments, but a sense of creativity around, well, we as Africans have, we have history, we have knowledge, we have our own technology technical skills, why don't we make an agreement to have, you know, at least 10,000 um, Chinese students come to different African universities um, on, on scholarships that might even be paid by China, but nonetheless show this sense of exchange. And 
in there was a business uh, conference that was happening parallel to the to the Fukaku conference, um, which was called the seventh conference on Chinese and African entrepreneurs. And even there, it, it was very clear that this is still the Fukak project is still within the hands of the elite of Africa who aren't interested in giving space to the working people of Africa because we have one of the youngest uh, populations or the youngest continents with the youngest populations with averaging ages around you know, 24, 25. And in the business conference, we didn't see a sense of acknowledging how do we bring young people into the entrepreneurial space, even on a kind of liberal rhetorical basis. And if you looked in the room, and even in the Chinese diplomatic uh, corps staff, they have a lot younger people, a lot younger people, whilst we were still seeing, you know, in the Congolese delegation, we're all over, you know, 50 years old. I mean, maybe some were a few younger, but we're not seeing a reflection of the reality on the ground, which is that young people are the majority, but giving them space to develop in partnership with China is totally absent. So um, if I can just end as a last sentiment, what I really liked in uh, President Xi Jinping's speech was he quoted Senegal's first president, Leopold Senghor, when, you know, a few decades ago, he basically said, let us answer present at the rebirth of the world. So let us answer present, like we are here, at the rebirth of the world. And that kind of offering from Xi Jinping, you know, drawing on Senggo, Leopold Senggo, I thought was an important call to action, protagonism and agency on the sides of all of the people involved. And from the side of the Africans and our African leaders specifically, it doesn't necessarily feel like they are present and are trying to advance at the highest level possible a development agenda that China could positively collaborate with us. So I think a lack of presence is one of the challenges that we as African people are going to have to deal with. And we know that that only cannot come from China, but has to come from us within our different nations and within our different uh, struggles for, for advancement and total liberation. Thank you.